I think it's pretty much well accepted that there's a gap between the rich and the poor. I, I don't think anyone would argue that. I mean, just by definition of people existing, there's going to be some people that have more than other people, right? So examining that a little closer, you can ask things like, why? Or how does it function? Or how do we fix it? Is it possible to fix that? Is that something that needs fixing? Or is it just the way things work? You know, like... You have two squirrels, and one of them gathers two nuts, and the other gathers one nut. And one of them has more nuts than the other one. So, like, it, you know, there's a lot of questions you can ask about that. And we understand different economic forces, like the Cantillon effect, where when new money is injected into a system, those who have access to the money first actually benefit the most from it, meaning they get the most value out of that money before it's uh, transacted and other people have a chance to get their hands on it. Um, we also know that when money is put into a system, it tends to flow towards the owners of things, whether it's the owners of property or the owners of a business. And you can figure this out yourself with logic, right? If you own a shoe store and there's $10 that get injected into society in one way or another, it doesn't matter. Someone has $10 and they need some shoes and shoes are you know, in that price range. Uh, well, then the owner of the shoe store is going to be a nice new owner of $10 suit, right? So the, the flow of money is well documented, well understood, well researched. And it's not taught very well to people who grow up in an impoverished area. So if you grew up and you were, you were struggling to make money in any way, you were struggling to put food on the table, maybe your parents always talked about money and it was just a chore. It was a burden. It was uh, difficult, right? People didn't want to mention money at all. Like, oh, yeah, power bill. No, oh, you, you spend it as soon as you get it. Oh, I can't leave the house without spending it. You know, whatever the conversation was. It was like money was a toxic thing. You may not have any idea what I've just talked about. Like, what is the Cantillon effect? You, uh, yeah, I'll leave some links down low. Um, that's exactly where I found myself just two years ago, two years ago, roughly. Yeah. And when you learn a bit more, let's park this car. Thank you for your patience while I drove around. Uh, when you learn a little bit more, you realize that it's ownership that sets people apart in the U S right? I, some people get this a lot sooner than I did. Uh, but that's basically what separates the rich and the poor is ownership whether it's land or buildings or stocks or bonds or business. You know, a business owner is also an owner of sorts, like the shoe store owner I was talking about. That is what sets the rich apart from the poor. Assets. And I don't think people think of it that way. I think in, in general conversation with your neighbors, with your family, of any demeanor, they think all wealth is inherited or all wealth is stolen. They don't think about what it actually means to be wealthy or what generates more wealth. It's the assets. You know, you, you have land. You can rent out that land. You can grow timber on it. You can build some kind of housing structure and, and rent it out for cash flow. Uh, there's, there's a lot that can be done with land. Um, with other types of assets there's a lot of research you should do and definitely talk to a financial expert before making any investment decisions but now we're in an age where investing in the stock market say is incredibly democratized you can you can start a brokerage account with all these dozens of apps that are out there and for at no charge no transaction fees you don't have to look into what you're investing in if you don't want to. I mean, Google's there. You can figure it out. But you can literally just do a quick search on any of these apps and dozens of thousands of securities will pop up. And you can buy any of them with the click of a button as long as you attach it to a bank account, right? So your access to the stock market has, how do you say? It's become a lot easier <laughs> to access investments in stocks and bonds, right? Uh, Land and housing is probably more out of reach for my generation and and the preceding generations than it was for previous generations, right? Housing costs are crazy. It's all you hear about. Like, I'll never be a homeowner. I can't afford to buy. Okay, okay, that's fair. 
Maybe you should change the location you're looking at. Maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe land is off the table, but that's another asset you could put in your pocket, make you an owner of something. And business. Business is tricky because uh, like we were talking about growing up in an impoverished state, business is not something you, you think about too much depending on the, on the um, neighborhood you grew up in, the friends you had. You know, you might sling some candy bars on the high school playground, but uh, uh, you're not really thinking of like, yes, I'm gonna open up a coffee shop or I'm gonna start a lawn mowing business. Some people were, yeah, yeah. And those are great examples of, of starting your own business, but it's not really on your radar. You're thinking about things like, I'm gonna work at Taco Bell until I die. What, what do people do outside of Taco Bell? I don't know. I was in that place. I was washing dishes for a restaurant. And I didn't know what people did for jobs. I, I, I didn't have a lot of creativity in that sense. I didn't know what people did at that point in my life. Right? And so the idea of starting your own business, there's like three things I could possibly do. I could mow lawns like my cousin. I could start a restaurant. Um, or I could join the military. It's pretty much it. And I go through this, this whole spiel for you because I think we have a financial education issue in the States. We, we cast a lot of blame on different people. We point a bunch of fingers. And, you know, there's a lot of sides to that argument. You're going to have some people who are like, get your house in order. You know, <laughs> you take care of you. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, and then there's other people who are like, you know what? We don't have because they have too much. So it should be redistributed. I mean, okay, fine, whatever. I, but if you zoom out a little bit, you stop arguing. You stop pointing fingers and blaming and trying to solve everyone's problem. Because you're not going to unless they want to help themselves. Or they're asking questions. Like You're not, you're not going to help them. <laughs> they, you just can't do that. Uh, if you zoom out a little bit and you understand economic forces, just a, just a little. I mean, for some people, it's going to be very boring. For most people, it's going to be difficult to do because it takes time. And none of us have time. I'm filming in my car right now. Like, none of us have time to just sit down and, and read Cantillon's essay on economic forces and whatnot. So, yeah, no, I get that. But once you understand how these things work... You understand that positioning yourself in a place of ownership is what you do to change the side of the divide that you're on. You get rich because you own things. And yeah, that could be stuff. Maybe you have a collection of shoes that you flip on eBay or something. Right, you're right. But that's not what I mean. That collection of shoes that you own is actually a business that you own. You're flipping things on eBay. That's a business you own. That's the kind of asset I'm talking about. And that separates you from the poor. Does that make sense? Like over time, the effort that you put into that business is going to generate wealth for you. And like I mentioned earlier, there's things like real estate and the stock market. But we never thought of that when we were growing up. We never were taught that. I had an economics class in high school and they just, they said stock market good. I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, I'm in high school, man. I have like one quarter. I, okay, I'm going to go wash dishes and work at Taco Bell. Right? So I've been thinking about that. I'm trying to think how, how can I play a part in helping people with financial literacy? How can I help? Because it's like giving a prisoner a key. You know, when they're stuck in a prison cell. For me, learning about this stuff was eye-opening. It was inspiring. It, it became what some people in the community call uh, hyperfixation. Like that's, that's all I wanted to learn about. This money, how it flows, how it works, what it is, where it comes from. How do you generate it? How do you, like, what is this stuff? Because my whole life, first half was like money evil, money bad, money painful. Okay, and in the second half was like, you get paid 
for a certain amount of money to do a skill. Okay. But like, how do I transform my day-to-day -day life from struggle and pay bills and at the end of the month I have $20 left into something that is actually rewarding, something that I can dream in, something I can, I can have lofty goals and achieve them. I can actually go travel if I want to. How do you, how do you retire? How do you do those things? So I was just uh, hyper focused on this thing. Like, what? What is money? How does it work? And that's the ultimate conclusion, right there. It's just owners, ownership, owning stuff, is what separates the rich and the poor. And uh, like I was saying earlier, with the uh, democratization—that's a tough word—democratization of the stock market, it's easier than ever now. Housing, real estate might be further out of reach. Stocks vary in reach. Uh, businesses probably very in reach. You can probably make a business a lot easier nowadays because of the internet. I mean, anything you can think of, you can probably figure out how to monetize. And it's not that easy, right? I, for myself and for a few others, you're like, okay, it's, that's great and dandy and whatnot. You know, be a business owner, start a business. What does that even mean? Like, what would I do? You're gonna be the next Nike. You're gonna make a better Microsoft Word. Like, what? What are you talking about? What is a business? How do I start it? Yeah, I get that. So let's put that in the medium category. Housing, flipping houses, maybe really hard, you know, on certain incomes. Uh, starting a business, medium hard. Stocks and bonds, super easy. And then there's pitfalls all the way through too. So like, that's where the financial literacy thing comes in. If stocks and bonds are very available, right? You can invest immediately. Well, how do you invest? How do you know what to invest in? What do you do with your money? Do you just stockpile it all in in uh, uh, certificates of deposit and like bond ladders because they're a little uh, less risky? <laughs> do you do you pile it all into uh, the latest hype, whatever that is at the time? Um, do you need a financial advisor? There's lots of questions. And I, I think that gets intimidating for people. I'm over here talking about like forces of economics and how to differentiate the poor from the rich, how to get yourself out of being poor to be rich, all that jazz. But it, if you're not arguing about it, then you're diving into it. And then you dive into it and you realize it's just this endless rabbit hole of stuff to learn. If you... You want to learn about money and how did money come about and then you got to learn about economics and then you're going to cover finance to whatever degree and finance is only half of a phrase what is finance well you really think about the definition there for just a second finance what are you talking about are you talking about like the flow of money are you talking about what money is are you talking about banks and the behavior of banks and their role that they play in a financial system is that finance no finance i mean sure but Finance is half of a phrase. Like I said, it's personal finance that you're learning about. Personal finance. Everyone's place and journey and what they're going through is different. Everyone's in a different place at any given time. So this investment vehicle that someone's using might be the right fit for that person, but it might not be the right fit for another person because it's personal, personal finance, right? And that covers so many topics. You're not just learning like, what is the S&P 500? You're learning about things like budgeting. Oh my goodness. And if you come from a place like I did, where it's just pain, money just sucks. It's it's a big bummer when anyone brings it up. You, The idea of budgeting is like poking your eyes out. It's, it's so painful to sit down and look at your bank account. And you get nervous. And you only feel good when you look at your bank account and there's actually money in it. I know. <laughs> you ask my wife, anytime we'd sit down to budget, uh, it would usually turn into an argument. It would usually just be me getting more and more upset for every minute that we were doing, you know, logging what we were spending, planning out this month, what we can spend for certain stuff, all that jazz. And it took me a while to get past that. It took me a while to be comfortable with spending money, having money, not just being this weird squirrel saver kind of person. But, I mean, thank God I'm just naturally frugal. Great. But I mean, that was born of 
not having enough growing up. So, which is fine. I mean, it turned out fine. So you're you're fighting this uphill battle with people, where you're you're saying like you need to be financially literate, you need to understand this stuff so that you can manage your own life and then get ahead, so that you can create that gap between the poor version of you and the rich version of you, by owning things. But you're you're fighting against so many inset these these inherent beliefs in people, these feelings, these reactions. The way you've grown up has affected how you think about money. It affects how you think about rich people, poor people, your own situation. It dictates your actions. And you're not just fighting ignorance. You're not just walking up to someone and going, hey, uh, I can help you understand finance, personal finance. I can help you understand how to change your circumstances and, and live a better life. And it may not be today, it may not be in three months, it may not be in the next five years. But in 10 years, you you will be sitting a lot prettier than you are today. I can show you that. And they immediately go, get away from me, you crazy person. You're just a rando on the street. Why are you talking to me? Also, you mentioned money, so I'm angry. So, like, there's, there's a lot that goes into that. But uh, it's kind of what I feel called to do just because it's it's what I'm interested in. It's, it's what I've been hyper fixated on, I love that phrase, for the past two plus years. It's, it's just like, how does this work? Oh, this is related to that. And it's just, there's just so many systems built around money and how it works. And how... I just find it fascinating. And that leads you into business and how business works and how to read financial statements. And how... it's, There's a lot of stuff I really enjoy about it. And I'm talking with family about it, I'm like, you guys, we don't have to we don't have to be poor our whole lives we don't have to just die on the job there's a way to stop working eventually there's a way to have a little less stress each month there <laughs> like uh, this doesn't have to be a big issue but you're fighting that uphill battle you're fighting that uphill battle with personal takes on money and the lack of financial education and and honestly society's view on haves and have nots everyone's going to have an opinion everyone's going to feel a certain way about not just money but those who have it and those who don't <laughs> so you come to them and you're like hey in seven years you'll be a little better off than you are today hey in 30 years you'll be thanking yourself because you don't have to you know, work what you're doing, you can relax a little bit. And they're gonna be like, get away from me, you gosh darn, insert slur here. So, anyway, I hope you're well. Hope you're taking care of yourself. Thank you so much for listening. And overall, I want people to know that it's possible to get ahead. It's possible to join the ranks of those elite rich people, you know, however you want to say that. It's possible to make your life better and take control of your finances and not have it be this toxic thing, but instead be something positive, enlightening, something that takes stress off your back. Uh, I want you to take care of you and feel good about it. I want you to be in a better place because you took those steps. And I, I don't know how to communicate that very well. So I'm going to work on that. I'm going to figure out a direction to go. But um, let me know down below any thoughts, any suggestions you can make. Because I think there's a really humane way to go about this. To, to bring this knowledge to people. To help people understand that it's not... You don't have to work at Taco Bell your whole life. That you don't have to die at your job. There are, there are options to help you. Um, I believe in you. And I believe in myself. So let's all get there together, okay? Take care of yourself. Talk to you later. Bye.